Hello everyone, West Harasaki here. We are nearly at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 27 is about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. In some ways, our entire study of Matthew has been pointing toward this climax. We should take this opportunity to understand as fully as possible the reality and meaning of the crucifixion. But first, there is the final saga of this man, Judas Iscariot. His is not an easy story. Questions arise as to his motivations and ultimate fate. No doubt Judas sinned, but we all have. No doubt he betrayed Jesus, but we all have. No doubt he was remorseful, but we all have been. Let's recall that Judas was one of the twelve, and he had traveled with Jesus and ministered with him for three years. Presumably he had won many to Christ and performed miracles in his name. He had given up nearly everything to follow Jesus. Yet he had an underlying penchant for deception, as we see by his ongoing stealing of money from the disciples in John. If we are going to condemn him for that, we need only look at ourselves and ask if we don't claim to give God all, yet keep a portion for ourselves. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us, from all unrighteousness. Well, Judah says, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. That appears to be a genuine confession of sin. So how is Judas any different from, say, Peter, who also failed Christ the same night? Unlike Judas, Peter recognized Jesus' prophetic truth in his failing, continued in fellowship with believers, remained open to re-establishing trust with God and ultimately reaffirmed his commitment to Jesus. Note that Judas cut off all possibility of reinstatement by committing suicide. He was unable to place his hope in God and thereby allow God to help him overcome his failure. Note also that his remorse may not have led to actual repentance. The word remorse is different from the normal word for repentance. Repentance means a change of heart, whereas remorse means to experience feelings of regret. Is that distinction important? Notice that Judas's confession of sin was not to God. It was to the chief priests and elders, and his recourse was not to fall on the mercy of God, but to return the money as if that would make things right. The Apostle Paul tells us that godly sorrow leads to true turning away from sin and turning back to God. On the other hand, worldly sorrow is mere regret that does not result in change or lead back to God. After the story of Judas, we resume the story of Christ's arrest. The chief priests and elders want to kill Jesus, but they have no authority to do so. That power rests in one man, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And whereas the Jewish leaders would consider Jesus' implication that he is God, or that he has authority over the temple, to be worthy of capital punishment, Pilate could care less about such theological issues. His role, given to him by Tiberius Caesar, is to keep the peace and quell social uprisings. To this end, he is obligated to listen to the protests of the Jewish people and punish any revolutionary elements that could arise against the Roman occupation. Who was Pilate? He was one of a number of Roman governors who were placed in power in Judea following the removal of Herod Archelaus, one of the sons of Herod the Great. Pilate ruled between AD 25 and 36. He is described as cruel and insensitive, heavy-handed, with poor judgment, he actually hated his subjects and had a number of brutal clashes with Jewish and Samaritan insurrectionists. His troops killed innocent civilians, and he took money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct. Well, this is the man before whom Jesus stands. Matthew and Mark tell us about the trial in similar fashion. John gives more details. Luke includes a consultation with Herod Antipas, ruler of Galilee, who happened to be in town. 
that interaction would probably occur between verses 14 and 15 in Matthew 27. Make no mistake, Herod does not have the authority to order Christ's execution. That decision rests with Pilate alone. Pilate asks, Are you the king of the Jews? King of the Jews is a loaded expression. The question was likely prompted by the Jewish leaders. The Jews object to it because it implies that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Son of God, and has authority over them. The Romans could object to it because it suggests Jesus plans to usurp Roman authority. However, the Gospel of John reveals that Pilate has further discussions with Christ, during which the governor realizes he has no such designs. In the end, both Pilate, as well as his wife, and Herod see that Jesus has committed no crime for which he should receive the death penalty. But the religious leaders and the crowds they have influenced will not accept an innocent verdict. They clamor for Christ's crucifixion. In an attempt to avoid condemning an innocent man, Pilate offers the crowd a choice, Jesus or Barabbas, a convicted revolutionary. Surely they will pick the known criminal who is probably already scheduled to be executed. In fact, it is quite possible that there are three crosses already erected for Barabbas and his two compatriots. To Pilate's surprise, the crowds want Jesus crucified and Barabbas freed. They see that Jesus is not going to oppose the Romans, and at least Barabbas is a freedom fighter. Pilate caves into their demands and makes a deliberate show of absolving himself of responsibility. Barabbas is released, Jesus is flogged, mocked by the Roman soldiers, and led away to be crucified. The Crucifixion It was customary for the condemned person to carry the horizontal beam of his cross to the place of execution, and John tells us that as they went out, Jesus was carrying his cross. But along the way, Jesus was unable to continue, possibly because of injury and blood loss from flogging. A man named Simon from Cyrene, today Libya, is recruited to carry the cross beam the rest of the way. He just happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Simon may have been a Jew coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Tradition says that Simon became a believer, as did his sons, Alexander and Rufus. If that is so, then maybe Simon was at the right place at the right time. The place of crucifixion was called Golgotha, which means skull. Why it had this name and where it was located is not known for sure. The site may well be the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, originally built by Emperor Constantine in the 4th century as a memorial to Jesus' crucifixion and burial. It is located in the heart of the Christian quarter of the Old City. Three Christian communities, Armenian, Greek, and Latin, all point to this site as the place of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. During the time of Jesus, this location would have been outside the city walls. Nowhere in the Gospels is Golgotha described as a hill. We get that notion from modern hymns that talk about the hill called Calvary. That name comes from the Latin for skull, and Calvarium is still used today as our Latin medical term for skull. Whatever the location, the crucifixion would have been a prominent public display of shame. Executed publicly, situated at a major crossroads, or on a well-trafficked artery, devoid of clothing, left to be eaten by birds and beasts, victims of crucifixion were subject to optimal, unmitigated, vicious ridicule. Two rebels are crucified along with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Might the middle cross have been intended for Barabbas, the leader of the insurrectionists? Watching all this is the mother of the Zebedee sons, and now she realizes with horror what she had requested of Jesus, that her sons be at his right and left hand. No one expected a crucified Messiah. Isaiah 53 provided a clue. He was despised and rejected by men. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
but virtually no one understood this to refer to the Messiah of Israel until after the resurrection. Crucifixion was the cruelest of Roman punishments, designed to deter anyone from even thinking about going against the government. People were nailed to a cross and left hanging by their arms, sometimes for days, while they suffered in agony, eventually dying of suffocation or cardiac arrest or shock. Sometimes to hasten death, the prisoner's legs were smashed. Given the unspeakable horror and pain of this form of execution, it is significant that the four Gospels hardly say a thing about Christ's pain and suffering. Why is this? Matthew simply says, they crucified him, and that's it. And he emphasizes how other people, the soldiers, the passers-by, the Jewish leaders, the two criminals, how they react to the crucifixion. It is as if Matthew is asking us to consider how we will respond to the cross. What happened on the cross is known as the atonement, sometimes called substitutionary atonement. It's a fancy name that means Jesus died in our place for our sin. Here are four things to consider when thinking about the atonement. The atonement is accomplished through Christ's death. That is, we are saved by Christ's death, not by his suffering. The atonement required Jesus to be abandoned by the Father. Matthew emphasizes Christ's pain on the cross, but it's not the physical pain, which is substantial, but the pain of abandonment. Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As hard as it may be to comprehend, there was a moment on the cross when Jesus ceased to be God and instead became sin. Incredibly, he was separated from the Heavenly Father and the wrath of the Father was poured out on him. Many would find this hard to believe, it goes against all that we think about Christ and his unity with the Father. But for us to be freed of our sin, this is how it had to happen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. The atonement is nearly unfathomable. In the working out of salvation for sinners, the hitherto unbroken communion between the Father and the Son was mysteriously broken. It is surely better to accept this, knowing that we do not understand it fully. The atonement we must accept by faith. God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the ultimate standard of what is just and fair in the universe. And he decreed that the atonement would take place in this way and that it did in fact satisfy the demands of his own righteousness and justice. Amazing things happen upon Christ's death. The temple curtain is torn. That it is ripped from top to bottom shows that it is a work of God, not man. Symbolically, there is now direct access to God for everyone who trusts in Christ. We have a relationship with Almighty God no longer mediated by a high priest and no longer limited to Jews. In fact, the temple is now obsolete and will in due time be destroyed. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. No wonder that within a few weeks a large number of priests become believers, as we see in Acts 6. A rock-splitting, 
tomb-breaking earthquake takes place. Remarkably, some holy people are raised to life from their graves. Who are these people? Likely godly, faithful people from Israel's past. How literal or figurative this event is, we can't be sure. But the appearance of these people is a foretaste of what all believers can look forward to. It is no more incredible than the appearance of Moses and Elijah in the Transfiguration. And is it not ironic that this all happens while people are waiting at the cross to see if Elijah appears? Gentiles begin to see God. Even as many Jews are rejecting Christ, a centurion and other Gentiles look at the cross and see not a dead criminal, but deity. The wider world is starting to take note. The Great Commission is next. But the most miraculous thing of all is that we are saved. We are saved. At the moment of death, Jesus cries out one last time. Matthew does not tell us what Jesus says, but it is no doubt the words recorded by John. It is finished. The phrase is a single Greek word, tetelestai. It is the same word used on ancient Greek receipts, and it means paid in full.